Third part of chapter 12 of the first volume of The Life of Reason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Fredrik Karlsson. The Life of Reason by George Santayana. Side note. Living Stability. These natural formations, tending to generate and realize each its ideal, are, as it were, eddies in the universal flux, produced no less mechanically, doubtless, than the onward current, yet seeming to arrest or to reverse it. Inheritance arrests the flux by repeating a series of phases with a recognizable rhythm. Memory reverses it by modifying this rhythm itself by the integration of earlier phases into those that supervene. Inheritance and memory make human stability. This stability is relative, being still a mode of flux, and consists fundamentally in repetition. Repetition marks some progress on mere continuity, since it preserves form and disregards time and matter. Inheritance is repetition on a large scale, not excluding spontaneous variation, while habit and memory are a sort of heredity within the individual, since here an old perception reappears by way of atavism in the midst of a forward march. Life is thus enriched and reaction adapted to a wider field, much as a note is enriched by its overtones and by the tensions inherited from the preceding notes which give it a new setting. Side note. Continuity necessary to progress. Progress, far from consisting in change, depends on retentiveness. When change is absolute, there remains no being to improve and no direction is set for possible improvement and when experience is not retained as among savages infancy is perpetual those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it in the first stage of life the mind is frivolous and easily distracted it misses progress by failing in consecutiveness and persistence this is the condition of children and barbarians in whom instinct has learned nothing from experience in a second stage men are docile to events plastic to new habits and suggestions yet able to graft them on original instincts which they thus bring to fuller satisfaction this is the plane of manhood and true progress last comes a stage when retentiveness is extorted and all that happens is at once forgotten. A vain, because unpractical, repetition of the past takes the place of plasticity and fertile readaptation. In a moving world, readaptation is the price of longevity. The hard shell, far from protecting the vital principle, condemns it to die down slowly and be gradually chilled. Immortality in such a case must have been secured earlier by giving birth to a generation plastic to the contemporary world and able to retain its lessons. Thus old age is as forgetful as youth and more incorrigible. It displays the same inattentiveness to conditions. Its memory becomes self-repeating and degenerates into an instinctive reaction, like a bird's chirp. Side note. Limits of variation, spirit, a heritage. Not all readaptation, however, is progress, for ideal identity must not be lost. The Latin language did not progress when it passed into Italian. It died. Its amiable airs may console us for its departure, but do not remove the fact that their parent is extinct. So every individual, nation, and religion has its limits of adaptation. So long as the increment it receives is digestible, so long as the organization already attained is extended and elaborated without being surrendered, growth goes on. 
but when the foundation itself shifts, when what is gained at the periphery is lost at the centre, the flux appears again and progress is not real. Thus a succession of generations or languages or religions constitutes no progress unless some ideal present at the beginning is transmitted to the end and reaches a better expression there. Without this stability at the core, no common standard exists, and all comparison of value with value must be external and arbitrary. Retentiveness, we must repeat, is the condition of progress. The variation human nature is open to is not, then, variation in any direction. There are transformations that would destroy it. So long as it endures, it must retain all that constitutes it now, all that it has so far gathered and worked into its substance. The genealogy of progress is like that of man, who can never repudiate a single ancestor. It starts, so to speak, from a single point, free as yet to take any direction. When once, however, evolution has taken a single step, say, in the direction of vertebrates, that step cannot be retraced without extinction of the species. Such extinction may take place while progress in other lines is continued. All that preceded the forking of the dead and the living branch will be as well represented and as legitimately continued by the surviving radiates as it could have been by the vertebrates that are no more. But the vertebrate ideal is lost forever, and no more progress is possible along that line. Side note. Perfectibility. The future of moral evolution is accordingly infinite, but its character is more and more determinate at every step. Mankind can never, without perishing, surrender its animal nature, its need to eat and drink, its sexual method of reproduction, its vision of nature, its faculty of speech, its arts of music, poetry and building. Particular races cannot subsist if they renounce their savage instincts, but die, like wild animals die, in captivity. And particular individuals die when not suffered any longer to retain their memories, their bodies, or even their master passions. Thus human nature survives amid a continual fluctuation of its embodiments. At every step twigs and leaves are thrown out that last but one season, but the underlying stem may have meantime grown stronger and more luxuriant. Whole branches sometimes wither, but others may continue to bloom. Spiritual unity runs, like sap, from the common root to every uttermost flower, but at each forking in the growth the branches part company, and what happens in one is no direct concern of the others. The products of one age and nation may well be unintelligible to another, the elements of humanity common to both may lie lower down, so that the highest things are communicable to the fewest persons, and yet, among these few, are the most perfectly communicable. The more elaborate and determinate a man's heritage and genius are, the more he has in common with his next of kin, and the more he can transmit and implant in his posterity for ever. Civilization is cumulative. The farther it goes, the intenser it is, substituting articulate interests for animal fumes and for enigmatic passions. Such articulate interest can be shared, and the infinite vistas they open up can be pursued forever with the knowledge that a work long ago begun is being perfected and that an ideal is being embodied which need never be outworn. Side note. 
nature and human nature. So long as external conditions remain constant, it is obvious that the greater organization a being possesses, the greater strength he will have. If indeed primary conditions varied, the finer creatures would die first, for their adaptation is more exquisite and the irreversible core of their being much larger relatively. But in a constant environment their equipment makes them irresistible and secures their permanence and multiplication. Now man is a part of nature and her organization may be regarded as the foundation of his own. The word nature is therefore less equivocal than it seems, for every nature is nature herself, in one of her more specific and better articulated forms. Man therefore represented the universe that sustains him. His existence is a proof that the cosmic equilibrium that fostered his life is a natural equilibrium, capable of being long maintained. Some of the ancients thought it eternal. Physics now suggests a different opinion. But even if this equilibrium, by which the stars are kept in their courses and human progress is allowed to proceed, is fundamentally unstable, it shows what relative stability nature may attain. Could this balance be preserved indefinitely, no one knows what wonderful adaptations might occur within it, and to what excellence human nature in particular might arrive. Nor is it unlikely that before the cataclysm comes time, will be afforded for more improvement than moral philosophy has ever dreamed of for it is remarkable how inane and unimaginative utopias have generally been. This possibility is not uninspiring and may help to console those who think the natural conditions of life are not conditions that a good life can be lived in. The possibility of essential progress is bound up with the tragic possibility that progress and human life should some day end together. If the present equilibrium of forces were eternal, all adaptations to it would have already taken place, and, while no essential catastrophe would need to be dreaded, no essential improvement could be hoped for in all eternity. I am not sure that a humanity such as we know, were it destined to exist forever, would offer a more exhilarating prospect than a humanity having indefinite elasticity together with a precarious tenure of life. Mortality has its compensations. One is that all evils are transitory. Another, that better times may come. Side note. Human nature formulated. Human nature, then, has for its core the substance of nature at large, and is one of its more complex formations. Its determination is progressive, it varies indefinitely in its historic manifestations and fades into what, as a matter of natural history, might no longer be termed human. At each moment it has its fixed and determinate entelechy, the ideal of that being's life based on his instincts, summed up in his character, brought to a focus in his reflection, and shared by all who have attained or may inherit his organization. His perceptive and reasoning faculties are parts of human nature, as embodied in him. All objects of belief or desire, with all standards of justice and duty which he can possibly acknowledge are transcripts of it, conditioned by it, and justifiable only as expressions of its inherent tendencies. Side note. Its concrete description reserved for the sequel. This definition of human nature clear as it may be in itself and true to the facts, will perhaps hardly make sufficiently plain how the life of reason 
having a natural basis, has in the ideal world a creative and absolute authority. A more concrete description of human nature may accordingly not come amiss especially as the important practical question touching the extension of a given moral authority over times and places depends on the degree of kinship found among the creatures inhabiting those regions. To give a general picture of human nature and its rational functions will be the task of the following books. The truth of a description, which must be largely historical, may not be indifferent to the reader, and I shall study to avoid bias in the presentation, in so far as is compatible with frankness and brevity. Yet even if some bias should manifest itself, and if the picture were historically false, the rational principles we shall be trying to illustrate will not thereby be invalidated. Illustrations might have been sought in some fictitious world, if imagination had not seemed so much less interesting than reality, which besides enforces with unapproachable eloquence the main principle in view, namely that nature carries its ideal with it, and that the progressive organization of irrational impulses makes a rational life. End of chapter 12 End of Volume 1 of The Life of Reason by George Santayana